What's going on, guys? Hello, welcome into Chicago's Monsters of the Madhouse, the Chicago Sports Podcast. We appreciate you all on our YouTube channel. You can like and like and subscribe on our page and on our Facebook page. We got so much going on, and it is my honor to introduce our all-star panel tonight. We got Kyle, man. You're looking good tonight, Kyle. Thanks for coming back. Thanks, Coop. What's going on, man? Yeah, it's good to see you. Brian, it's always good to see you too, man. We're never going to forget about our favorite Bears player, Mitch Trubisky, in the background. You always never disappoint, Brian. Boom. Never disappoint. It's always hanging there. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Good to see you. You're looking good, good you. tonight. Hey, guys, it is my honor to also introduce to you right now our guest for tonight to talk some Bears and NFL draft and everything going on around the NFL from CHGO, Nicholas Moriano. Nicholas, what's going on, man? Thanks for coming back to the Madhouse. Uh, nothing much. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to talking Bears football and, you know, picking your guys' brains too. So it should be a fun time. Yeah, man. There's been a lot of talk, especially on our shows here the past couple weeks. And I'm just going to get right into it because I feel like I'm intrigued by everything going on right now. Normally around April, like we were just kind of talking before we got on here tonight. We're excited for opening day tomorrow. Like that's that's what we're yeah. talking about. I mean, I got my White Sox shirt on. I know Kyle's got his Cubs shirt on. Yeah, we're, we're, we're representing tonight, man. We're pumped. But so normally this, time, normally this time of the year, dude, we, we're, I'm like more rich treads with baseball, but we're in such a unique position with the Bears right now with that number one pick. And I kind of feel like reading on Twitter and all social media this week about Caleb or last week too, the meetings with Caleb Williams and the, the different days of what they went over with Eberflus and Ryan Poles. And then there's George McCaskey in the background observing everything. Have you ever when you're covering a, a, a team like this and talking about a team like this, have you ever been this intrigued or has there been th this much attention around one certain player from what you can remember? You know, I mean, that's a, it's a really good question because it's all this attention around a player that's technically not on the bears yet, but it seems like a <laughs> foregone conclusion, you know, being what March 27th that Caleb Williams will be a Chicago bear. Um, so I don't know if I've been, since I've been covering the bears professionally, if I've seen that much attention, to one prospect, but I get it. It is Caleb Williams, and there's a lot of layers to him. I think a lot of things that are, you know, maybe misinterpreted by some people in terms of how he is off the field, but there's no denying what he could do on the field and the throws he can make and how he can attack a defense with his arm, with all the different arm angles. But it is a different kind of attention. He is already, in a sense, a superstar in the college game, being that, you know, he's in Dr. Pepper commercials, Wendy's commercials. He's on – what the the bag uh, for the trolley gummy worm like this guy is a superstar but yet he's he hasn't even stepped foot onto an NFL field and thrown a pass in the NFL so there's a lot of stardom around Caleb Williams so as as rightfully so there's also a lot of attention but I've never been you know so entrenched wherever I've gone so whether I was at the Shrine Bowl Senior Bowl the Super Bowl Media Week USC's Pro Day the talk is Caleb Williams and it is a lot different from years past where that definitely wasn't the case about one particular prospect. Nick, do you, were you surprised by the lack of interest for Justin Fields? I, I was, um, I've always liked Justin Fields and, you know, just to, when you see guys like Sam Darnold and, you know, Gardner Minshew and guys like that go and go for what they did, like you could, Look, it could be either an eye test or you can just – I know you can look at numbers and maybe look at passing numbers. Maybe some of those guys like Gardner Mitchell technically had passing numbers, but it's like Justin Fields still has a lot of potential. I don't care what anyone says. I, I know that, you know, maybe the NFL thinks otherwise based off of what the compensation that the Bears got for him with from Pittsburgh. But you put that guy in the right offense with Mike, with Mike Tomlin as your head coach and – I just think that once he gets his opportunity, like that's a guy that I'm not willing to bet against because from what I've always seen from Justin Fields, like I, let's, let's, let's say for example, it would be midway through the season and the bears are, you know, just maybe starting that turnaround defensively. We would get into the locker room on Wednesdays, you guys, and Justin Fields, the offense, they were always still out there working. Maybe it didn't translate you know, offensively, like you wanted to see on the field on Sundays, but the dude has, he puts in so much work and he, he is the, you know, first one in last one out type of guy. So when I just think of still the potential he has as a quarterback and what he can do to threaten defenses, not only with his legs, but as a passer, I was really surprised. And, you know, I just hope that Justin Fields does get that opportunity in Pittsburgh and, you know, is able to kind of showcase what he truly is capable of because, 
there were so many different variables and factors in Chicago for the reason why he didn't work. I mean, you have the fluctuating uh, offensive coordinators, the offensive line in shambles. You finally get him weapons in in year three. And, you know, Cole Komet, DJ Moore do have career high seasons, but it just wasn't a consistent improvement, enough consistent improvement to where Ryan Poles and this Bears organization can look at themselves with the number one overall pick and say, man, can we really, you know, devote a this financial commitment to a guy that we still want to see more of when we have the number one overall pick and when there's a a talent like Caleb Williams. But I definitely was surprised that, you know, he went for a six-round pick in 2025 that can be a fourth with 51% of the snaps if he plays that. So I definitely was surprised, but I'm not – I'm not counting Justin out. I just can't do. I just can't do that just based off of the guy that he is. Yeah, no, I agree 100. percent I don't think we've seen the last of Justin Fields. I think he was more of a, a victim of circumstance. It was just the mm-hmm. timing. You know, he came into a team with a, a salary cap mess. Ryan Poles had to tear it all down and rebuild it, and he kind of suffered the consequences. No doubt, and I think too. Like I, I always tell people and. You know, there's so obviously, you know, still people are, are mad about the whole trade and how it went down and just not having Justin Fields. But really, I just look at it like sometimes life isn't fair. Like it really isn't like given like he was drafted by Ryan Pace at the end of that regime and how everything was going to almost salvage their their time with the Bears. That didn't obviously work out. And then again, all those different variables, all the, the change that was going around Justin and he just never. I never had the best opportunity to kind of develop um, as a pure quarterback. And, you know, when you start to see again, that, that's that, that improvement last season, it just, it just wasn't enough. And I always just tell people like some life isn't fair. And we can all probably attest to that at some point in our lives or something didn't go right for whatever reason. But, you know, that's a guy, like I said, that regardless of the circumstance he's going to be in in Pittsburgh, not technically the starter yet, but, I'm not, I'm not rooting against, I'm not betting against him because that's a guy that's going to put in the work and everything I've heard from behind the scenes, even though people like he can't read a defense. Like, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Like from what I've been told, just from talking with people close to Justin, like the dude will pick up Pittsburgh's playbook like that. It will be quick and he'll be able to decipher it and go through it. And, he, you know, Russell Wilson is going to be going through this too for the first time with the new playbook there in Pittsburgh. So they're at an even playing field a little bit. It's just once you kind of get into game action and he does have a little bit of longer arm release or a throw release. So maybe that impacts exactly those anticipatory throws that maybe we didn't see enough in Chicago, but he's going to learn this offense and his physical talent's not going to keep him off the field for long. I know that. We're talking to Nicholas Moriato right now. We appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Monsters of the Madhouse, Chicago Sports Podcast. You guys could like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Follow us on our Facebook page, too. Keep up to date with everything going on in Chicago. Want to say hello to Patty Lura, uh, BJ. Also want to say hello to Brandon and uh, Brandon Kyle, your brother, that's to, uh, listening tonight and watching it on us tonight. So thank you guys all so much for watching. You guys can leave a comment down there on the bottom. If anything you want to ask Nicholas, please feel free to do so. And uh, it bears everything right now as we're talking about the draft, uh, Caleb Williams. Because I want to talk to you a question about uh, the pro day that just happened. Um, you were you were there. You were witnessing everything, and everything that I've watched online looked great. Now, I, I, I mean, from what I was able to watch, I liked everything, including that bomb at the end. But when you're there in person and you see this guy, because let's face it, when you're watching on X or Instagram stories, you, you, things become sometimes a little bit bigger, sometimes a little bit smaller. But when you're there in the person, what is something that stood out to you outside of all that? Maybe there was like a characteristic or something that Caleb, maybe something we don't know about with Caleb Williams that you took away from that. You know, with seeing Caleb Williams for the first time, and this is even actually at the combine, but even at the pro day too, like his leg he's got a a strong lower half you guys like the dude does not skip leg day and i appreciate that for (laughs) caleb williams and i mean when i was talking to some of the defensive players that have played him just last season that kept getting brought up where you know you try to tackle him low and like the guy is just breaking off tackles and look justin obviously did that in chicago but Caleb does have that capability to one break tackles. If you do not have a form fitting, like you're going to have both hands wrapped up, like his lower half is just a lot bigger than I think a lot of people give him credit for. But also there is just something to seeing the ball just shoot out of his hands in person. And I know we see it 
like even from like the press box view or you know you watch it on like x or, or tv or whatever but when you see it in person it, the best way it just comes out natural like he's been throwing a football forever like it just there's no there's no hiccup in in his throw it just it's a beautiful nice release you could just honestly watch him throw all day and I think the script that they had in place there at the pro day, they really wanted the emphasis that he can one operate the script as a pocket passer. Because I think a lot of the criticism that you might see with Caleb Williams is that he can't play in structure. Like he likes to improvise, go outside of structure, you know, wait for those longer developing plays, even though there might be a check down that can get a first down. I think he did a really nice job of just really operating what the the whole game plan was for USC and you know, it's routes on air. They rehearse this. He's throwing to teammates that he's been throwing to all past season. So it should look clean. And from what, you know, I saw in person, what people watched on TV, it did look clean. I think there was four passes that weren't completed. Two of them you could probably put on the receivers and then two overthrows by Caleb. But, I, you know, just the way he throws the football, it is natural. And, you know, especially on outbreaking routes, I like to see the timing – and then the zip on the ball, where the ball gets placed as the receiver's making the break and extending his hands out, the ball's right there on the money where it needs to be. Because if it's, you know, any slow or if it's a step slow or behind the receiver, that's that's an easy way where you see pick sixes happen all the time in the NFL. So in a, in a script that they rehearsed, they practiced, and then executed, I mean, I think you, you saw that from Caleb Williams. And then that, that final throw was a nice little touch to mm-hmm. kind of end the day where – just on the money. And Brendan Rice was the receiver who caught that. They had missed on a deep throw earlier in the pro day. So it was nice to see him go back to that, look at each other. They were kind of talking a little bit before the, the rep actually happened. And then just launch a deep, beautiful throw and beautiful catch by Brendan Rice. Yeah, it seems like a, a lot of Chicago Bears fans had concerns about maybe his character, his personality. Uh, is there anything that sticks out to you in particular about just what type of person he is as opposed to what type of player he is? Yeah, I just think that, you know, how he carries himself, he's he's one, he's very confident. He's very confident, but also he's not he's not shy when it comes to talking with the media. He's going to be very authentic, be himself. Um, I remember just back at the Combine where he doesn't even get to say hello, good morning to the media. Like this big, huge scrum. And I don't know where this dude was at who yelled out that answer. He must have been like 12 rows back. But he had intention to get his question out there, basically questioning, you know, Caleb Williams, uh, whether he likes to compete or not. He wasn't doing the throws at the combine, wasn't measuring all that stuff. And like Caleb Williams didn't even get to say good morning yet, but he handled the question, that question, then the rest of the press conference, you know, perfectly. Like nothing could really get him off his game. So, you know, I think that speaks to the character that he is, the preparation that he does to one, get those interviews right, but also like, Every teammate that I've talked to, and this, again, going back to the Shrine Bowl and Frisco, Texas, Senior Bowl, there were a couple of USC guys, and then even at, at, you know, the Combine and then obviously at the Pro Day, like, there is a genuineness that these teammates talk to, talk about Caleb Williams with, and a lot of it comes with, like, his competitiveness. I remember uh, Marshawn Lloyd, the running back, was like, man, this guy um, – whether it was like bubblegum chewing, which is a strange thing to be competitiveness, competitive in, but Caleb is, uh, to like dodgeball, like Caleb wants to win these things. So, you know, maybe that might rub rub some people the wrong way, how, how competitive he can get. Sometimes the emotions come out a little bit, but all this stuff that he's self-centered or selfish or, you know, he's a me type of guy, like personally, I just haven't seen that. And I, I've never heard any of his teammates talk about that. And again, I don't, I would, I, there's no benefit for their team, for his teammates to throw him under the bus. So I, I guess it is a kind of a, a skewed person to, to ask, but he is, those are his teammates. They don't need to say all these glowing things, but they do. And they usually do so without even being provoked to, to say something. So I'm not too concerned about like any of the character, like rumors that we've heard about Caleb Williams. If anything, what he's shown throughout this pre-draft process really tells me that he's ready for all this pressure because I feel like a lot of Bears fans, like you got to take the Bears to the playoffs. You got to have a CJ Stroud like season. And I get it with the number one overall pick and trading Justin, there should be high expectations, but 
I, I think Caleb's ready for that. And if anything, he embraces that. And I think there was one of his answers at the combine where he, he basically, you know, said he wants to be one of the greatest to, to ever play the game. Like he put that on himself. He didn't have to say that, but that's what Caleb does. He puts his expectations on himself. And you know what? Like that's a guy that continuously, like I said, through his pre-draft process has just shown me that, yeah, he could probably handle it. So that's, I mean, if that answers the question, like I, I really don't oh, I have so. those concerns. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how he can, again, handle this big market like Chicago. I know Ryan Poles has said that, and that was at the combine too, when we got a chance to talk to him. It's like, when we're looking for a quarterback, we want to find somebody that is not only can handle pressure, but can handle the pressure of being in this big market like Chicago. I think Caleb Williams has those characteristics. Somebody, um, might actually have been Ryan Poles, uh, came out and said that they like evaluating these guys that are on these NIL deals better because they've actually been thrown to the wolves. They've been financially stable for a while as far as they're concerned. Have you noticed a, a pattern in that as far as the, when the NIL deals were implemented? I mean, have you – I mean, Yeah, the- well, I mean, I know Ryan Poles was saying, like, you know, <laughs> now that these guys do have – they have money. They do have – and Caleb Williams definitely has a lot of it, but, like – you're able to see these guys kind of spend a little bit on like the Christmas gifts that you'll normally see. I'll tell you this too. Like when I was in the bears locker room and it's like Christmas time, they're giving out gifts. You see all these like iMac books and all these like grills and stuff. I'm like, damn, must be nice to be, you know, so it's Jalen Johnson's teammate, you know, just getting paid or not. But like, that's what Caleb Williams is doing. He's taking his offensive line out to dinner. He's buying, the, the, his offensive line, some Christmas gifts. So I think that just speaks to, again, his character that it's, he doesn't need all that money and he's going to make a lot more than every single one of his teammates. But you're looking for those, those characteristics, those traits to show that, Hey, this is a team guy. He wants to keep those guys happy. The, or not even just keep them happy, but just be a genuine person, right. Too like it's the holidays, give out some, some gifts and stuff. But I think that's what he, excuse me was looking for in terms of like now with NIL being a part of, you know, every college player's evaluation, but how do they use that resource? Is it just, let me go buy, you know, this nice car and, you know, Caleb Williams, he lives in a penthouse. Like it's fine, but yeah, he does give that back and he has a charity that he, he is a part of as well. So I don't know, man, like everybody that brings up like these things about Caleb Williams is like, where are you getting this from? And yeah. do you have some type of agenda right now? I, it I, seems, mean, it, I understand seems you want to be, break guys down, but I don't it seems know. to be a, a false narrative created no. by the Caleb Williams naysayers, the, the Bears yeah. fans that were upset about Justin Fields leaving. What, what do you think personally for you, Nicholas? When do you think that Caleb Williams will be prepared to bring the Chicago Bears to a playoff caliber level? Well, I just think with, with Caleb Williams, his game really translates to what the NFL is now it is a passing league It is a league in which you need a one a signal caller that can not only make all the throws but can decipher a defense nobody's looking at and adjust to adjust to whatever the defense is bringing on any given play and i just think that and we got to see how this all meshes up with shane waldron but when you look at just the offense what caleb williams is coming into the skilled players specifically like that's a he is in such a great position to really maximize that talent. And I love the addition of Keenan Allen. That's I know they say tight ends the, the quarterback's best friend, but when you have Keenan Allen, the way he runs routes, like that is somebody that I know that Caleb and him are just gonna have that instant connection and throw in DJ. You throw in a receiving playmaking back like DeAndre Swift and Cole Command. Like there are just a, a ton of options that Caleb Williams will have at his disposal that will give him an opportunity to succeed in year one. And I think it's, if anything, there might be more pressure on Shane Waldron more than anything to get the most out of all these guys and put all these, these weapons in the right positions that they need to be. And like when you watch USC and like what Caleb Williams had to deal with in terms of an offensive line protection wise, He's going. He's probably going to a better situation with the Bears, and they still have some some things they have to figure out on their offensive line. But there are so many times where you know a gap pressure 
and Caleb Williams like somehow makes a play, whether it's you know throws a ball away when there's immediate pressure up the middle, or you know sometimes can can make a play downfield like that. May, what could could it happen with the Bears? They still got to see who Ryan Bates, um, Shelton, who's going to be the center. But he's going almost in a better situation than he's is going in a better situation than he was in college. So I really, if anything, I'm watching. I'm looking at Shane Waldron. And I know he had success with Gino and you know did some good things in Seattle, has a background with McVay and things like that. But I'm curious to see how he can one just maximize all this talent in year one. I think it's gonna take a little bit of a grace period in the beginning, but there's just too much talent on this offense now, even with a rookie quarterback to for this offense not to be humming and doing some really good things uh, by the end of 2024. We're talking to Nicholas Moriano. We appreciate your time today, man. CHGO. And we got you for a couple more minutes. Uh, thanks to everybody in the chat too, as well. You kind of just answered one of the questions about the translation of, of, of Williams into the NFL. So you guys keep them coming, man. If you got any more questions here as we have them on for a couple more minutes, uh, Nick, I got to ask you about the number nine pick, which I find very intriguing over the last two weeks, especially because there's a lot, there's a quarterback draft according to a lot of the experts out there, quarterback draft. And the guy that has real that put this beers in the favor for that nine pick is JJ McCarthy. Because when we first had all the mock drafts coming out, JJ McCarthy, the ones that I've read were not in the the first round. I was going to like maybe the second round. Some even said the beginning of the third round. But here he is, possibility of a first time pick um, from certain things that I've read over the last week and a half about possibly the commanders thought he looked really good. Uh, you never know what the Broncos are going to do or the Giants are going to do, which would put the Bears in a very good position right there. So do you think if that's the case, if some of these teams do trade up and you got four quarterbacks going in the first 10 picks, I know you never know what's going to happen with polls. He could trade back and grab some more picks because we don't have many in this draft. However, if you got one of those stud players falling down to number nine, like Odudze or all, I feel like it'd be very hard to not to not to to, to say, hey, we got to stay at this number nine spot and get that impact player. Yeah, the Bears are in a really good spot. And, you know, if Denver wants to move up, would that be – would the Bears be in that that range that maybe they feel like they can get one of those quarterbacks? I don't know. It might be a little earlier than that. But the thing is, like, with four draft picks going into 2024, I feel like Ryan Poles feels like he's comfortable with that. But that's not to say, like, it depends on how the board all falls because the three positions he mentioned – at the owners meetings down in Florida was wide receiver offensive line, and then some type of pass rusher. So, you know, at nine, you're probably getting the best defensive player on the board that you, that he's looking at. You could probably get that. And if these quarterbacks are just continuing to go, you know, four in the top, let's say seven picks, you're getting one of those wide receivers, whichever one that, whichever one's your preference. Malik neighbors was blowing it up at the pro day today with all that. the numbers <laughs> Uh, Marvin Harrison, obviously we know everything he did at Ohio State. And, you know, Roma Dunze is obviously, a, a one, I think, maybe the fan favorite for Chicago Bears fans right now. So you could go that route. And, look, I can make the case for, you know, doing I, any one of those three positions. But it would be, I think, if one of those blue chip players is there at nine, I think Ryan Poles may just say, we're just going to take an immediate starter, plug him into our offense, and roll with it, and then we have, what, pick 75 and 122 after that. And we can see what the Bears will do there. Maybe they'll get flexible trade back with those two uh, fourth-round picks. But it might. it's going to be tough because there are going to be – I think there's going to be players at nine that you could plug and play on this Bears offense or defense, however they want to look at it, and immediately get those guys that you don't have to – It's not. you're not projecting really. You're obviously they need to acclimate to the NFL game, but – they're going to be immediate impact players. Um, I do see a scenario too where Ryan, you know, can look at his board and be like, "Well, this is a deep wide receiver draft, though." Like I know Dunze, Neighbors, and Marvin Harrison are the top three, but God, I mean, I like so many other guys in, in this in this um, crop of wide receiver. Brian Thomas from LSU, uh, Lad McConkey, and Ricky Pearsall from Florida. Like, there's so many impact wide receivers that I think you can get even later that, you know, if you come away with one of those guys, you're still feeling good with the wide receivers that you have currently tackle is not as deep, but like if he, if Ryan Poles and Ian Cunningham, both being former offensive linemen deem 
a guy like Fashanu or even Joe Wall is being an upgrade over. They're going to be upgrades over Braxton Jones, but if they need them. Hey, like I get it. You guys are former offensive line. What's the best way to keep Caleb Williams upright? Make sure he has protection up front. And to have two stalwart tackles in Darnell Wright and, you know, potential, you know, top 10 pick, like I wouldn't fault him for that either. So the bottom line is I think the Bears are in a really good position, whatever direction they're going with, with this ninth pick, whether it's actually making that selection or, or training back, because I just think there's so many good players that are going to be available that also happen to fill positional needs that the Bears currently have on this roster. But if I were to ask you guys, what are you kind of feeling with number nine? Are you, are you thinking they want to stay there? And do you have a guy that you, you guys like? I mean, I would love to see Joel on the Chicago Bears. I do like Braxton Jones. I just think that you can't upgrade from Braxton Jones. I think he's he gets he got better the first two years, but Joel is could possibly be perennial pro bowler for the next 10 years. And I really don't think, like you said, I really don't think you can go wrong at the nine pick. If they take one of those big three receivers, especially Malik neighbors, he's, he just, so beside, if, if Marvin Harrison's off the board, which I'm pretty sure he will be, Malik neighbors would be my one, one, a, one B to, to Marvin Harrison, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if Ryan Pulse traded back. I think you, I, I think, I don't think he'd be traded back too far, but also wouldn't upset me if he traded back from say nine to 20 and somehow ended up with a 2025 first round pick. I don't know if the bears necessarily plan on winning this, Super Bowl in 2024. So I think this is more of a two year plan. So I, I, he, he, there's so many options he has at the nine, nine pick. It's nice to see the Bears have have multiple options in the draft. Yeah, I kind of agree. Um, I'm in the same boat. I think Neighbors is better than a little better than Odunze. He's just got that wow factor. Um, I don't think Alt's going to be there. I think he's definitely going to go to the Chargers. I mean, it's just what, what Harbaugh likes. He likes to yeah. go out. out. Um, you know, uh, I do like Odunze. Don't get me wrong. I'd, I'd love to take him at nine. But um, like I said, if neighbors or, you know, say all you know, happen to fall or something like that, you've got to jump on those guys. But I, I would be more in the camp of trading back, maybe try to get a Powers Johnson or something like that around the 20 pick or um, something like that. And, you know, if, uh, you know, you can get like uh, Xavier Leggett or whatever from South mm-hmm. Carolina in the later rounds, I mean, that'd be a hell of a wide receiver to pick up. Yeah, I'm torn on this. I, I I kind of feel like I guess it all like to, by being part of the quarterbacks play out the way it might play out with with how they get drafted in the beginning. I feel if one of those wide receivers, not to your credit, what you said, but there's this a great draft for receivers, and you could probably find some later on. I think there's 26 total that are in this draft. There's a lot of receivers that you mm-hmm. can. Go out and grab. However, if one of those do fall down to number nine, I can't imagine when you have a rookie quarterback coming in, you want to give him as much firepower as you possibly can. And if you think it's one of those, you got to go with that. I don't know if you trade back or not for this. I think that number nine pick is too valuable with some of these impact players, supposedly impact players that you can go grab. Now I say that, and then you look every year of what the Packers and the Chiefs and the Lions and how they go out and find all these random, how they go out and find all these playmakers that they go and plug and put in. And, I, and we've kind of talked about this on the show, too, that if, if you could find players like that and just kind of take that of what they do. And I know that's not the easy thing to say and do, but um, you, you can go out and find some of those type of players, even in the wide receiver position. Yeah. And look for the one critic. I mean, there's a couple of criticism from Ryan Poles, but outside of trading for DJ Moore, when you look at the wide receivers that he's one drafted or acquired from, you know, Chase Claypool, like there's still, there's still question marks about him and the evaluation of that position, but you know, it does make it a little easier if you drop or you draft in the top 10, knowing that these are stud blue chip players that, Hey, like I know my evaluation can't be very far off because everyone's thinking the same thing about these guys. So it, it would be interesting to see, I, w- I would like to see Ryan Poles obviously, you know, hit on that position in the draft. And not to, you know, Tyler Scott still has some time, but, you know, Bayless might, he may be saved on this roster with the new special teams kickoff rules and how that's going to go. His position may have a little bit more value, but that is a position, position that we still need to see him become a little bit more consistent with. It was nice getting DJ more, but yeah, it, it's definitely, it's nice that this draft does have a bunch of guys. Yeah, a bunch of guys. So even if you're the worst wide receiver evaluator out there, you you, you got to hit on one of them, I would think. So it, it's That's good cool. that Ryan Poles is in this position now. Well, Nicholas Mariano, we appreciate you coming on tonight. CHGO, hey, could you give us a preview of uh, what we can expect or what you might be working on right now? Yeah, so I, I feel like if I'm not at the, the studio in West Loop right now, 
Uh, we have this Bears 100 board that's available to our, our diehards. So you get a subscription and you get this diehard board, but it's basically a Bears 100. And it's it's centric to the Bears needs. And, you know, we're putting the top 100 players. So literally I'm I'm just watching tape and putting everything down there, doing handwritten notes with uh, my little Samsung pen here and just putting it into this database. So if I'm not on Twitter as much or anything, it's because I'm usually just working on this database. Maybe I'll like put out some clips here and there, but that's literally where my time is gone. And, you know, it'll continue to be like that way until the draft comes here. But yeah, um, I, I really appreciate you guys for one, having me. I always love talking bears and, you know, getting the perspective of other people who, who cover the team and, you know, just seeing what everyone's kind of thinking about this team because, it's exciting. Like this is going to be a hell of a 2024 season, regardless of how this draft ends up. The bears are finally putting themselves in a position to, I think just change that narrative. Kind of like what Ryan Poles was saying, the Pat McAfee show, like wanting to, to change the narrative around Chicago. Like they are being put in a position to finally do that. And it's, it's exciting, man. Cause I'm tired of covering teams that don't go to the playoffs, get their ass whooped by the Packers. Like let's, let's, let's change that narrative, man. Let's, let's, let's try to get on the winning side of these things. Let's, let's, let's turn the page. Thanks yeah, I think it's about time on, to Nick. do we that. Really yeah. So we, we, we appreciate your time, Nicholas Moriano, everybody. So yeah, we'll be following you along, man. And thank you for great work from you. And we appreciate your time and we'll hope to get you back on here again. For sure. Thanks you guys. See ya. Thanks, All right, you have a good night. Nicholas Moriano guys, CHGO joining us on the Madhouse tonight. Monsters of the Madhouse, you can like and subscribe on our YouTube page, on our channel, watch some of the past shows on there, on our Facebook page, Twitter as well, as I just retweeted uh, on my Twitter feed. So there's so many different avenues or different platforms that you guys can watch us on. So thank you so much for taking the time to watch us tonight. Brandon, Bears Junkie 23, HOF, Cheryl. Cheryl always giving us the bull scores. I'm afraid to even look at that right now. Uh, yeah, we're getting killed. So after after that this abysmal loss the other night, uh, it's not working out much better. Uh, Brandon and everybody else, thank you guys for chiming in in the chat. You know, he brought up some interesting points because kind of to what I said at the beginning of our, our conversation, this is such an interesting time. And that's why I wanted to ask him because a guy that's around the team so much about the type of player because we don't see this very often where we have that type of quarterback that can come here to be on, on the Bears. Well, we did have that. It was Mitch Trubisky the last time around, but that, that didn't end up. But I don't feel like that was much – I feel like we were, had the excitement, but it was nothing like it is right now. And you got a chance to talk to him. We got a chance to talk to him to be, be out at the pro day, and it was interesting to hear him say – just the size and, and just seeing him in person, the way he was throwing that bomb that make us more excited as bear fans to see what we could possibly have. Yeah. I mean, the bears not only have, I don't believe they've ever had a, a tr had chance to draft a quarterback with this much excitement around them, but I really, I can't remember an offensive player that they've drafted with as much excitement around them. I mean, the, the bears have been, always been known to be the, the defensive team in the NFL, the hard hitting team in the NFL. They've had a bunch of great drafts, a bunch of great defensive players, Brian Urlacher, Lance Bridge, all those guys. But this is the first time in at least my, my a long time that the bears have had a chance to draft an offensive player of, of Caleb Williams caliber. I'm still waiting for Kevin White to show up. <laughs> oh man, boy! Talk. How many years ago was that? That's been a while. Oh, man. I'm least... trying to think. That was what 17, 16? Because he had all those injuries, but he kept, he still kept playing though. Like he's like the last was only like a year or two ago. He was on the Saints. He like he made the roster, and was, I believe he made the roster. I can't even remember. Yeah, he had. I mean, yeah, he did. Uh, he had one really good game with the Saints, over 100 yards or something like that. And uh, I believe it was 16 because Trubisky was 17, right? Trubisky was 17, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, Kevin White just had his own wing in the hospital. I mean, it, he just I mean, could not stay healthy. I mean, as soon as he got to training camp, didn't he have a rod put in his leg? <laughs> oh. You know, it, for him, it was just about bad luck. I mean, we could say we, we we could guys, we could do a whole show about busts for the Bears, and and we can probably do about a whole week of shows of busts with the Bears, especially for the wide receiver position. I mean, for the, the wide Bears, receiver, but I they, feel like with Kevin, maybe they over evaluated him at that time, but he just got hit with those injuries so bad that at that same time, it was hard for him to um to even just come back and be at that any type of level when you yeah, get it's, that hurt. It's, it's tough to blame the Bears for Kevin White because if you look back on that draft, the general consensus was that he was going to be a very good player. I mean, right. Everybody everybody had him high in their in their draft rankings. He was high in every mock draft. He just – it seemed like he was just couldn't, couldn't beat that injury bug. He just kept getting hurt every single year, and I think eventually – like the NFL is not for long, man. You get these guys, you got to come in and you got to make an impact immediately. And if you don't, 
they'll chew you up and spit you out. Thank you guys so much for watching the Chicago Sports Podcast, Monsters of the Madhouse. It's a pleasure to have all you guys with us tonight. We got Kyle, we got Brian. We're talking Bears, we're talking draft. We are going to talk a little bit of opening day baseball here in just a little bit. You know, I do got my White Sox. I don't, I don't wear the White Sox stuff very often on the show. I'll see. Sorry. Hey, Brandon, I'm going to put the <laughs> remove button right now on Kyle. No, I'm just kidding, Kyle. We, we, we wouldn't do that to you. We wouldn't do that to you. It's um, going to be a rough season for you, Matt. It's going to be a yeah, rough Yeah, well, yeah. That, well, why do you think I have a, f- a fridge full of beer for tomorrow for the first game of the year? <laughs> so, um, but, yeah, so we, we are going to get in a little bit of opening day, maybe a little bit on the tournament here this weekend before before we head out tonight. But we are talking Bears football right now. Oh, Bears Junkie 23 uh, says David Terrell. Oh, man, I forgot about him. There was another one that was drafted very high who's a stud at Michigan, and uh, he just – did not pan out, man. I, I I was I was I was kind of surprised on him. Yeah, I, mean, I saw a post a while back of uh, it's all the wide receivers the Bears have drafted, drafted since Kevin White, and it's just not good. I mean, even Vilas Jones, the third round pick. Now, I don't necessarily blame Ryan Poles for that. He Ryan Poles is young. He got hired about thirty five. He was the young. He, he was learning on the job. He's going to make mistakes. Every GM makes mistakes. Yeah. Lynch and, and, and Sam Fran makes mistakes. Lance, Trey Lance was a disaster. Uh, but I think for the most part, Ryan Poles has done a really good job. And I, I trust him to make this pick, and I trust him to, to, to build this team towards the future. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree on Bayless Jones, though. I mean, I always, you know, play around with them on mock drafts this time of year or whatever. And, I, you know, always uh, – Bayless Jones killed UK a lot when he was at Tennessee. It just mm-hmm. destroyed us, you know, over and over. <laughs> he got a little old. Um, but, uh, I mean, Bayless Jones, I thought he was going to be a stud. I mean, they, I mean, the guy's, you know I mean, built like, you know, built like a running back, but he plays wide receiver. I mean, he's hard not to like when you see him physically. Yeah, he is a pretty big dude, and it's it's interesting because I feel like he's been a, a hit or miss on certain on certain certain times during the years that you watch him. And you could go back and look at the drafts and say, "Hey, why didn't we why did we take him there?" But you know, we got another year here, and we're gonna find out what he does and where we end up going in the draft here. You know, guys, it's interesting as we were talking to Nicholas about the draft and the number nine pick because I really am intrigued by that. I I'm more intrigued by number. We know ninety nine percent of us think that Caleb Williams is going to be drafted. If, if the Bears are going in all in on these press conferences to go out of their way to talk about what they what, – um, how much they've met with him, and like it would just be like a disaster if they did not take him. Could you imagine like after going through all that? But the number, the, uh, the number nine pick is interesting because I think the J.J. McCarthy effect has really – um, is really affected this draft. I, I think there's so many quarterback needy teams out there that they're going to go up there and over, over, maybe overdraft somebody. I don't know. I don't know where JJ McCarthy goes. I, he could be a very good quarterback in the NFL for all I know, but that could work in the bears favor. And if I have to rank them and I'm going to ask you guys, if you had to rank the needs of the team right now, I think it goes wide receiver, defensive end, defensive line, and then offensive tackle. And It'll be interesting to see where those type of players land in place in this draft. I guess it depends who you take. You want to take the best overall for your team. But if you guys had to rank them, how would you put it? Yeah, I'd, I'd be right there with you. I'd say that uh, wide receiver is number one because we've talked about this before. I mean, Keenan Allen does have injury history. And if you do lose Keenan Allen, you're down to DJ Moore and Tyler Scott. Basically the same thing you had last year minus Darnell Mooney. It'd be nice to go get a, another receiver who can grow with Caleb Williams, kind of a security blanket. If you're not going to draft a receiver, you definitely need to add another one in free agency, maybe a Tyler Boyd type player. But I'd say receiver is definitely number one. Number two would probably be defensive end or even defensive tackle. I mean, when Matt Eberflus got hired, the first thing he said is, you know, this whole defensive scheme runs around the three technique. Now, I don't know what they expect from the the two defensive tackles they drafted last year. If those get Jervon Dexter's, Pickens can make a, a, a big leap, then they may not have to address that position this year, but they definitely need to address the pass rush. If Montez Sweat gets hurt, or just isn't playing like he was at the end of last year, then the Bears are in trouble. I mean, they, they, the reason they became, they, through those last six games of the season, I believe the Bears had the most interceptions in the NFL, and that was all credited to Montez Sweat and that pass rush. you got to make sure you sure up that position. They didn't even add a, a, a really a veteran in, in free agency. I think they're, they're waiting for the draft for that. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, – I'll go wide receiver. Uh, I really want to enter like a center. 
Um, so I go wide receiver, center, and then defensive end. I think Demarcus Walker's well. I mean, he's good enough to hold down that fort if we don't happen to actually get one that's actually starting caliber right away. I think he's good enough to get you know a young guy groomed uh, if we can get one later in you know in the draft that has a lot of potential. Um, that center position though, I mean, that's been bugging us for years i mean i don't know if it's justin fields unable to identify where the you know the pass rush is coming from the center's not being able to help him out but we need, really need somebody that knows how to read a defense somewhere along the line and caleb williams coming from college you know assuming we're drafting him like everybody else um he, he can use all the help he can get on you know especially picking up that playbook and stuff like that it would really help for a center to come in and actually know what they're doing yeah, i saw an interview well with I, I think you you so I was just saying to, to you, Center, oh, yeah, that, that they were talking about making Ryan Bates the starting center, and that's slightly That's concerning. what I was I mean, just going to say, they, yes. You get, the center is a very important position, especially for a rookie quarterback, young quarterback. You know, it's going to take Caleb Williams time to adjust, to call audibles, to learn NFL defenses, to learn schemes. He needs help, yeah. and it, it's, it's concerning to say that you put a guy who is basically, what, a perennial backup, and then you – played guard, mostly guard, and you're bringing him over to Chicago to switch his position to center. I mean, we've seen this before. The Bears have done this before, and it never seems to work. The only time I can think of was Roberto Garza. Wasn't he a guard? And we got he him. He did. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I, that's a good one. You know, you, you bring up a good point there, Kyle, because I was just going to say the same thing when you talk about the center position. I truly think it's Ryan Bates. I think that's why they made that trade. You know, they gave up – they they traded for him for the for the, for the pick, and they, they liked him before. They liked him two years ago when they almost signed him. And then the Bills matched their offer, but something happened there. I don't know what happened over the last couple of years, um, but I don't know if he kind of went went down a little bit or if it was a money. I know the the Bills had cap issues this year, so maybe that was a trade and they saw some other players that could have been a cheaper. I don't know the whole story. I'll have to go back and read some of the Bills beat reporters. But I found that an interesting one because I, I don't know what we're going to expect with Ryan Bates as a center. Do we, Is he an everyday center? Is he an everyday guard? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I thought he was more so coming in because of our, our guards position and some of the injury history a little bit with Jenkins. Um, it, it's same thing with uh, Davis last year being out a little bit and kind of struggled at times. He, I know he did it certainly the last part of the season. And you, you just, it was, it was kind of a, a, um, a toss up that you need to have that position. You need to have the um, players in place for that position. So I, I truly believe it's Ryan Bates. And I think if they would have really wanted to go after a center, they would have addressed that in free agency. Yeah, I mean, when they brought those two centers in, I was coping that those were both depth pieces. But the more you hear Matt Everflus talk, the more you hear Ryan Poles talk, it seems like Ryan Bates is in line for that starting center job. It'd be nice to see that even if they can't accumulate more draft capital, it'd be nice to see them go out to maybe the third round and grab grab a center. And maybe if, even if he doesn't start immediately, somebody who can grow with Caleb Williams. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, we have up to 50 people watching the show tonight. So thank you all for watching on our YouTube channel. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys so much. You could like and subscribe on our YouTube page, on our Facebook. Guys, by the way, on our Facebook, if you watch our show, uh, you can check out all of our shows on either YouTube and Facebook, but also on our Facebook page. We uh, keep you up to date with everything going on in Chicago sports every day. We have a great team that works here that works really hard for all the posts. So you guys can check that out. And more shows coming up throughout the week as well. We got a lot to get to tonight as we are talking Chicago sports. We got opening day tomorrow night. We're going to get to that here in just a little bit and maybe a little bit of tournament because – I'm intrigued by some of the games this weekend, and it's tomorrow's going to be a great day to watch sports. I, I'm so pumped for tomorrow night. I, I, I mean, I got everything set. I'm gonna we're gonna end the show. I'm gonna see what you guys got planned and, and everything ready for baseball season, and um, might be a beverage or two tomorrow night too. But I, I, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> uh, anyways, guys, <laughs> you know we talked a lot about the Bears here in the uh, draft. As we look at the draft here, we're just Oh, less than a month away. So it's the today's the 27th. So what? The draft's on the 25th, which is going to be a lot of fun to be out and about. And I, I brought up some of the questions earlier today when we had Nicholas on, and we talked to him about the quarterbacks and stuff. What intrigues you outside of the Bears? So when you take a look at this NFL draft, so let's put the Bears aside because we've talked a lot about Caleb Williams, that nine pick, and who we're kind of looking at and what type of positions. But when you look at those top ten, the top ten teams right now, or maybe a team that's looking to trade up, I'm gonna go around. What what guys intrigues you the most, or which team intrigues you the most, or which player do you think could be the best fit for one of the teams in the top ten? 
I think the team that intrigues me the most is the Arizona Cardinals. You know, you keep hearing all these rumors that they're looking to trade back, they're looking to acquire more draft capital. If I'm not, if I'm, if, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they have four second round picks this year. I mean, the Cardinals decided to keep Kyler Murray. So if, if I'm in the, if I'm them in their position, my, their job now is to build around him. I mean, I, I don't see any way you could pass on Marvin Harrison Jr. I believe that Marvin Harrison Jr. is a generational player. I believe he's the best player in this draft. And I think if they draft him and pair him along with Kyler Murray, he could change the the trajectory of that franchise uh i'm chargers i mean may, maybe it's my own selfish thing but i really would kind of want joe Holt to to fall you know i really want him to slide and if the chargers for some reason trade out of that pick i think that's the best chance he has to do that and uh, you know if we get end up somehow landing him at nine i mean that's, that's a double win right there. Caleb Williams and Joe Alt, you know, one and nine. So Chargers is the team that I'm going to be nervous for most when they you know, see their name come up on the clock. But as far as trading up, I think the Broncos, they, they got to do something for a win. I mean, everybody knows Minnesota is going to trade up. But I just want to see if Broncos are going to do absolutely anything at all this offseason. Well, it's interesting you bring up two points there, Brian. First off, with the Broncos, uh, Sean Payton said it at, at the NFL meetings that it's a realistic possibility that – they could trade up and, and go try to get a quarter. So I, I mean, that's for for me. That's saying it right there. That I think that's a good. If, if the deal's right, they want to do that. And the Chargers are interesting to me too because they just got rid of both of their wide receivers. Now, granted, guys that have been there a long time, they probably want to get a little bit younger at that position, and they got to save their money. They were against the cap, and they went on the defensive side. I thought for sure Mac would be gone and Bosa would be gone, but they found a way to keep. I think that's a major win for them right there is keeping those two guys. Uh, but. The receiver position for them now, that they got Herbert there, and you got one of those receivers. I feel like it'd be very hard. Yeah, the lineman we we talk a lot about all, and I, a fantastic player. And if he's still there at nine, I, I think I think all of us are agree that's probably the, what, we, what we would probably go with. But if to have Marvin, if Marvin Harrison is still there at five, and let's say one of those teams do trade up outside of the Cardinals, get move the Cardinals back, I think it'd be really hard to pass up on Marvin Harrison Jr. or one of those wide receivers. Yeah, when Jim Harbaugh was talking the other day, it sounded like he 100% plans on taking a, a, a blue chip player at five. He does. I don't think he plans to trade him back at all. He was talking about how the, the first three picks are most likely going to be quarterbacks, and then a team might trade up with the Cardinals to take another quarterback. There's a very good chance that the Chargers get the best player in the draft outside of a quarterback. I mean, whether it be Marvin Harrison Jr. or Joe Alt or somebody else they fall in love with, I don't see how you could pass that up. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead Brad. I was going to say, I agree. Um, I mean, as far as uh, taking a blue chip player, but I mean, I still think that, it, you know, if the price is right and somebody's going to trade up for J.J. McCarthy, say at five, you might be able to slide down and still get a blue chip player a little, a little bit later, especially uh, um, with what the Giants were saying at the Combine. Um, apparently, it was the worst kept secret at the Combine was always the Giants want to trade up. For, they wanted one of them uh, top three spots, but nobody was willing to come off. Well, I don't know if that was J.J. McCarthy, whether they thought he was going to fall in the top three, but now you're hearing J.J. McCarthy, he might go to two. And, you know, he, he worked his way up somehow and, you know, in shorts um, to number two overall, <laughs> and, you know. So I, I don't know if that drops Jaden Daniels down or Drake May down, but one of them guys might be there at five, and that might just be too much for them to pass up. You know, I was. it's funny you say the Giants. I was reading – I cannot remember if it was the GM or the owner that was talking. might have been the GM, but they were at, – at the, at the meetings this weekend, they were going around and saying, hey, uh, what, what? of course they asked about the quarterback situation. And he goes, well, it's my understanding that Daniel Jones is going to be the quarterback. Oh, that was probably – I think it was the owner, but he goes, however, it's their call. I'm, I'm going to let them do what they want to do, meaning I'm like, okay. So, like, y y they probably have an idea of what they want to do. It's going to be the right offer, the right trade, or – Who's going to give you what in order to move up for that draft? Yeah, I mean, two wrongs don't make a right. I know that the no. <laughs> Giants just threw a bunch of money at Daniel Jones, but for me personally, he's not the answer. If they have an opportunity to go up there and take one of those quarterbacks, I would do it 100%. The Giants don't have a good team. They need they need position players. They need receivers. They need offensive line. They need So you might as well go and get one of those quarterbacks right now and see what you, if you can start building a team around him. You know, we got Bear Junkie, 23 Hall of Famer, says, if we trade down, I like Johnny Newton from Illinois. Yeah, a solid player. Uh, thank you for the comment, uh, Bears Junkie. And if you guys want to leave a comment, feel free to do so in our chat. You guys can do that on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. This is Monsters of the Madhouse. Got Kyle and Brian with you tonight. I'm Matt Cooper. As we are talking beers, we're talking NFL, talking the draft. You know, before we get into – and then we're going to get into opening day baseball here in just a second, guys. 
Let's take a look around our division because as we try to map everything out here, we talk a lot about Bears and what they're going to put into this draft. But I think it's important to still keep an eye on what's going on because we got some very good teams in our division. I still think our the, I don't think the Lions and the Packers are falling off next year. So I, I like I like what both teams did in the offseason. I really do. I I, I like I, I I like Aaron, I like Jones a lot, but I think Jacobs is more of a dynamic player. I think he's going to fit that offense very well for the Packers. Um, they got McKinney from the Giants. I think that was a huge pickup for them, and they draft well. So they they got rid of some of the players that I believe that they said, you know, what? I don't think we need to pay like a Campbell, the linebacker, and some others. We don't need to pay these guys money. We'll go we'll go draft the replacements. Then on the other side with the Lions. They picked quietly. I call them quietly. They went and got a cornerback, Carlton Davis, who I thought was always very good with Tampa. I know he had a little bit of a difficult year that last year, but now, well, now that Cam Sutton's not there anymore, uh, that turned out to be a, a pretty good trade. And then DJ Reader is a good, very, very good player. Yeah, if you guys so. don't know him, he's from the Bengals, and he had some very good years with them the last couple of years. And if you listen, if you go and watch all the players on the Bengals and saying what was, a, they, they'll say that he was a big part of why their defense was so dominant. So I like what they did. So what 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 stood out to you guys in our? I didn't even bring up the Vikings yet. I mean, they don't have a quarterback. So, um, but I, I even like some of the moves they made. Like they they draft well too. So what what has stood out to you guys about our division so far? What teams or teams do you guys like what they did, or what do you think they got coming up? Yeah, what stands out to me is just how good the NFC North is. I mean, two years ago, this was the division in football that was kind of the laughing stock. People are saying they're the worst division in football. I mean, not only were both the Lions and Packers good last year, but they both got better in the offseason, and they're both good at drafting. The Lions took a lot of scrutiny last year for passing up on B. John Robinson to ultimately draft Jameer Gibbs running back anyway. But in that process, they landed Sam Laporta. They they, they got Jameer Gibbs. I mean, that team is good and getting better. I think there's a very good opportunity. I think there's a good chance that Sam Laporta ends up being the best tight end in the NFL next year. He looks like he, yeah. you know, I know a lot of people give him this nickname, Baby Gronk, but he looks, he's, he's a Travis Kelsey type player. He's, he's tough to cover. He could play all over the field. You know, Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery are probably maybe one of the best one-two puncher running back in the NFL right now. Their offensive line is good and got better. The the Packers added, like you said, they had Josh Jacobs, McKinney. I mean, they got better. They're a young team. They're all growing together. You, know, you expect more from, from Watson and, and Dobbs and all those guys. I mean, the Bears have some tough competition. They got to keep up. And the Vikings, uh, they're – they're still a great offense. They still have TJ Hawkinson. They've got Jordan Addison. They've got Justin Jefferson. They just added Aaron they're Jones. Jones. They're just yeah. they're just a quarterback away from competing with the rest of the teams. And I think that they're probably going to go up in this draft and take one. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, young. I mean, <laughs> the division's still young. Um, young, talented. Um, the one thing that stood out to me in free agency that's it's bugging me is the fact that Aaron Jones is still in our division. And it, <laughs> I cannot get over that. I was so happy when he was leaving uh, Green Bay. I was like, wow. I was like, cause I think he's better than Josh Jacobs. Personally. I know Josh Jacobs is a little younger and Jones is a little bit more banged up. Yeah. But when he's there, I, I, I really believe that, you know, he's superior to Josh Jacobs. I was like, yeah, cool. They traded down a little bit, you know, but got more years out of it. And then he's still there, <laughs> you know, but, uh, I think Detroit just lost Reynolds to uh, Broncos this year. Yeah, Reynolds is Reynolds is was a free agent, but he, he had yeah. an up and down. He had an up and down year last year, though. Yeah, yeah, he was just with uh, he was with Jared Goff for like seven years, though. I mean, it had to be a little safety net for him. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I still don't think. Uh, I mean, Detroit in any way is going to regress. I mean, at all. I mean, they're they're going to stay up top. Um, I mean, Packers started picking it up. Aaron Jones or. Uh, Aaron Jones, uh, uh, Jordan Love had a great year towards the end. You know, he, he started out a little rough. Um, watching him, he always said, it's like, this guy's going to throw a lot of interceptions. He has no zip on the ball, and he somehow found it. I don't know where – I mean, for the first, like, five or six games, he was just, like, floating it out there. I was like, well, the defense, why, why, why can't they get under this? <laughs> but, you know, he, he stepped it up. I think he had the highest passer rating the last five games of the season. And then you got uh, – I mean, Jared Goff, I mean, he would – I mean, what he's done in Detroit, I mean, he would just be the Bears all-time leading passer by now. I mean, every year that he's been there, he would have our record. You know, I mean, he, I mean, he think he got cast off by the Rams by the way that deal lined out. But, I mean, in other words, Detroit looks like they got the better end of that deal aside from that Super Bowl. Um, and like you said, the Vikings, they're just – they're like us right now. They're a quarterback away. 
Uh, I mean, they we're, we still haven't drafted ours, so technically they haven't drafted theirs either. So what I'm more curious about is what the outside perspective of the Chicago Bears is. What are what are Lions fans thinking? What are Packers fans thinking? What are Viking fans? Thinking? Are they afraid of Caleb Williams? Are they afraid of? I mean, you had Keenan Allen across yeah. from DJ Moore. Cole Komet's underrated. I think he's only going to get better. They signed DeAndre Swift, which really hasn't been talked about much. But the Bears are in a prime position to, to compete in that in that division, and it could very well win it if Caleb Williams doesn't go through this, the rookie pains that some quarterbacks go through. Well, I think it's interesting you bring that up. And Brian, you just made me think of something here when you talked about Jordan Love. Now, Jordan Love's been in the league for a few years. However, he pretty much was his rookie year last year. He was thrown in there. I mean, it is his first full year playing. This is what you don't know what you're going to get with a rookie quarterback. I don't care who, how good they are or where they're coming from. And it depends what type of players you got around them, the system that you're in. But you, we could see. I think we, I think we got to be realistic as Bears fans here too. We got the weapons, but there's going to be times Caleb Williams is going to struggle next year, and it, it could cost us a couple games. Could cost us some intercept. Like Jordan Love had that period with the Packers. If middle of the season, remember when they were not scoring points, and we're like, uh oh, he's not very good. And then something clicked with him. Now that's credit to to their head coach. They got a great head coach on the floor. Absolutely. Who, who, whose offense is so creative. I love the way – I love I hate watching the Packers, but I love the way I'm watching their offense because it's so creative and it's so good. And they finally figured something out with them. And I think that's to the question to our offensive coordinator and our coaching staff is we're going to have to have that development in there with Caleb Williams because there's going to be times – or maybe there won't be. Maybe there won't be as much as we expect, but I think a lot of us can't expect that there's going to be times he's going to be out there and he's going to look – the game, he's going to have to adjust to the speed of the game. So. Yeah, I mean, Caleb Williams is coming into a perfect position. The Bears were a seven-win team last year, and they, they also got better in the offseason. I mean, not, you know, they didn't sign any of the big splash free agents, but that's what Ryan Pohl said from day one. He's not going to sign premium positions in free agency. He's going to trade and draft them and draft and develop. It's too expensive. They already committed $98 million to Montez on the other side of the line. They were never going to sign Daniel Hunter. He was way out of their price range. They weren't going to sign Wilkins. It's it's I'm, it's, it's, I'm really interested to see what they do in this draft because like you said we expect Caleb Williams to struggle we expect him to have those rookie woes well if the Bears can address the defensive line and sure up that defensive line that, and that pass rush they their defense could carry them they, if even if Caleb Williams struggles it, it, you could still win if you allow 10 points yeah I mean look, look what they did to the uh, uh the Lions and the Packers I mean the last game we played the Lions where they scored 13 points and I think the Packers were really hot and they only scored 17 we just needed some type of offense you had Keenan Allen to it and if uh by the time we have them on the schedule if Caleb Williams is already feeling himself by then we might really have a good shot and finally that owning stuff will be over with I'm tired of hearing yeah that's a that's that's a really good point (laughs) I think I think I mean we all obviously we already know the Bears opponents for the 2024 season but what when 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 they play them is going to be very important to how how the Bears finish the season. By the way, that's a that's a funny conversation. My my girlfriend and I were talking about that the other day. I, I, I say this on the show. She's a diehard Steelers fan, so she just asked me. She goes, "When does the schedule normally come on?" I'm like, "Well, you got to wait till the draft first. So it's, I feel like it's always the draft, and then it's a couple weeks after that that put they start putting they start putting everything together. Where the home yeah, and there's, way and there's and always. Stuff. There's always a few games leaked out that you you know you start to get certain games like you'll it's, they'll be like oh they're playing the Vikings on a Thursday night especially the prime time games seem to leak out mm-hmm. a couple of weeks before the full schedule is released. We did get the Hall of Fame game. Yeah, with the Texans. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm glad you brought that up. So we we got something with that. Uh, um, and I I, I think uh, some of us planning on a try. I, I I know some of us were talking about it and possibly thinking of heading up there for the trip. So. Um, something to consider, something to think about, and we'll certainly think about that with our guy, uh, Brandon Tracks, the guy that runs everything, our man that runs Chicago Sports Podcast. Hey, guys, speaking of Brandon Tracks, uh, not only is, a, is he a wonderful individual. See, I'm trying to suck up. God, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Brandon, no, uh, this Saturday, guys, uh, Monsters of the Madhouse, Chicago Sports Podcast. Uh, Saturday is going to be out at Bridges Scoreboard in Indiana. Now, Bridges Scoreboard, one of our best sponsors. They've been here with us for a very long time. Cool place. Great food. It's going to be a good hang. Will Purdue. Will Purdue is going to be their signing autographs. Going to uh, uh, sit down, spend some time with us. So you guys make sure Bridges Scoreboard on Saturday. That is at 3 o'clock. So uh, you got your stuff to run around in the morning. Get your Get everything ready to go. Then you can go there. Baseball will be on. Baseball, you'll be able to watch that. I know the White Sox are playing in the afternoon. The games, the basketball games will be going on a little bit later that day. So 
Uh, it'd be a full full fun day at Bridges Scoreboard. Grab some drinks and food, and then Will Purdue. Uh, Brandon Tracks will be out there as well, so you guys can meet him. So make that, put that in your phone, put that in your calendar, write a Facebook status about it, damn it. And uh, we'll see you guys there. Monsters okay. of the Madhouse, Chicago Sports Podcast. Thank you guys for watching tonight. We appreciate you all so very much. You can like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Watch some of our past shows. Heck, I was just doing that uh, last night. I was going through my YouTube feed and going through some of the shows, uh, some of the ones in the past. Sometimes when I go to the gym in the morning. See, that's the beauty about the show, guys, is you could take it wherever you want to go and, and listen to it. So like and subscribe. You can do that on our Facebook page too. You can check it out. And we appreciate you guys, uh, all your support tonight. Uh, guys, we got a, a couple more minutes left in Monsters of the Bad House. I do want to talk a little bit about opening day, which is tomorrow. I I can't believe that's tomorrow. I I, I keep it. First off, all of us growing up as kids, opening day was, I felt like it was always in April, right? It was always like the first or like the second beginning part of April. But here we are at the end of the week in March. I'm like, is it? it's getting like earlier every year. But either way, it doesn't matter. We love it. And uh, we have traditions. It's the first of like 162 games. Like I, I feel like opening days are, and then by Saturday, like, okay, opening day is over with. However, you get excited for baseball season. For me, it's about the weather and about planning out trips to which ballparks I want to go to, even though if the Sox are going to lose 100 games. What do you guys think of opening day? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, baseball's back. I mean, it's, it's the last – since the Cubs won the World Series, they've still been a competitive team. They've been fun to watch. I know that there's been a couple of year rough years there when they traded everybody away. I think those are the right moves. But what jumps out to it's it's I'm I'm really I have no idea what to project how to project the Chicago Cubs this year. For me personally, I got them between 85 and 90 wins. I think they won 83 last year, and I think they got better a couple of different positions. But they're still missing a couple of key pieces. I think they need another starter. I think they need to add to their bullpen. The good thing for the Cubs is they have a deep farm system. And they can use a lot of those guys as trade bait. Yeah, I mean, springtime's here. That's what comes to mind here. <laughs> you know, I'll start looking at the schedule, figure out, uh, you know, the local team down here is uh, Cincinnati Reds. So I'll figure out who's coming to, you know, visit the Cincinnati Reds and try to get my tickets. You know, the games I want to go see, you know, it's, it's hopefully it all lines out right. And the weekends are always nice up there. <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's a hard part when you try to plan some of these trips out and they get like delayed or rained out or something. I hate that so much. It happened to me one year. I forgot where um, Detroit. I like we usually like to go to Detroit. I have family in Detroit too, but I love going to Comerica Park. I think it's just so nice there. It's a cool place. It's got bars and restaurants all around it, right next to Ford Field. And it, it's that's as cool as you could just go and plan those trips out to the ballparks you want to go to, depending where you're at. Uh, Kyle, so let's talk a little bit about the Cubs. I mean. Yes, we'll get a White Sox question in here, but I mean, there's really not much to talk to talk about with, with what they got going on. Uh, even when Chris Getz says, is this a complete, he said something, I saw an interview with him earlier today, asking, is this a complete team? No, and how players didn't want to come there. And I'm like, all right, I, I'm done reading this. But uh, so Kyle, I'll start with you. Uh, we talked a little bit about this before we jumped on today. I agree with you with the Cubs. I think they're going to be a very good team. Obviously, the manager upgrade, Craig Consul, I like what he did with the Brewers here the last couple of years, even though if you read some of their beat writers up there, they had some questions about some of his in-game decisions. But that's every manager. You can question any. Every manager is going to be questioned about something. I agree with you. I like the lineup. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put the Cubs lineup up right now. This is a projective lineup, opening day lineup. Um, you got some power in there. You got some balance. Are they missing? I, I, here's what I think. I think to your point, I think they're missing another bat. They, they're going to need another power hitter in there. And I think a lot of this is going to depend on Christopher Mor Morrell. Uh, what type of year is he going to have? Is he going to bring that big back to the lineup? I know he's going to go back and forth between being a DH and the, and a third baseman. And defensively, that's where the questions were at. So to me, when I look at it, I think that's going to be one of the key players in this Cubs lineup for them to succeed. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think Chris Romero and Michael Bush, the, the first baseman they acquired from the Dodgers in the trade before this a couple weeks, a couple months ago, I think both of them play a huge role in the Cubs season this year. I think if Michael Bush hits for power this year and say Suzuki's consistent and plays like he did at the end of last year or like he did in spring training, I think the Cubs have a really good lineup. If they get into those same struggles they had last year where they go months, weeks, months where nobody's hitting, then they're going to be in the same boat they were last year. Like I said, for me, the, more, the biggest concern is pitching right now. You don't really know much about a manga. You don't really know much about James and Tyan's injury. Their fifth starter is still, I think it's it's ultimately going to be Javier Assad. Well, well, Jameson Tyan is out, but he's had ups and downs in spring training. They, they needed to add another. I was really surprised they didn't take a run at Jordan Montgomery. That was a great move by the Arizona Diamondbacks. I thought I mean, a fantastic move. And that's it's another good thing for the Cubs is besides the Diamondbacks, Dodgers, Braves, and Phillies, the NL is weak and got weaker. The Padres got rid of 
they're Blake, Blake Snell. They got rid of Soto. They only got worse. I mean, it's a very weak NL this year. I think the Cubs have are in a perfect prime position to take advantage of that. I think the division's still relatively weak. Although I do think the the Reds are the dark horse in the NL this I year. It's a team I'd watch out for if they if their pitching can be more consistent. I mean, they have a, an amazing lineup. Some of the, one of the best lineups in all of baseball. But I mean, ultimately, it comes down to to if the Cubs can play consistently. Seiya Suzuki to me is is that is the the key piece. If he if he if he has an MVP caliber season, the Cubs will be good. If he doesn't, they're going to be mediocre. Yeah, I just think they need another bat. <laughs> they they got to score some runs. Y'all y'all's defense is stout. I mean, where are y'all going to? I mean. The uh, outfield alone, <laughs> I mean, it's just stacked with defense. I mean, you got gloves for days out there. If y'all can put up some good runs, get in the 90 win column, I mean, you'd be set. I mean, I, I don't think the Reds will even hold that. So, I mean, I, I think uh, that's probably your magic number going in. It's probably 90, and uh, you're walking away with that division. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because I, I do think the Reds are a dark horse team with all those young players in that lineup. And if they stay healthy and they produce, I think they're going to score a lot of runs, especially mm-hmm. in that ballpark. So they're the team I'm going to be looking at in that division. And to you guys, I, th- I think I agree with you. I, I was thinking about this a little bit more um, about the win total of, with the Cubs. I know you said 80, between 85, 90. I think it's probably going to be somewhere in that range, um, depending how injuries take effect with this or if players don't produce or if they go out and make some trades. I, I think around that, that that's, a, that's a good bet. Uh when it comes to the Cubs, now Steele, that we had a scare with Justin Steele when he got hit off the leg with that with that line drive, but he said he's good to go. I like the bullpen a lot. Do they have dominant players in their bullpen? I don't know the answer to that question. There, there's probably there, no. I can tell you there, there's. If I look on paper right now, there's better bullpens in baseball um, compared to what the Cubs are going to be put, putting out there. But I do think Craig Council is a very good manager for managing the bullpen. And that should make a, that should make a difference for some wins this year in at least a couple of games. Yeah. I, I, it's tough to tell. I mean, right now, you know, they signed Hector Neris to be that dominant bullpen piece, but he's who, who's been, on the he's Astros a, last year. Yeah. Yeah. He's had a rough spring training. I mean, he's been, I think the last time I looked, his ERA was about 11, maybe just over 11. Uh, Adbert Alzale is kind of a question mark. He played well last year, but he also had times last year where he, he got he got hit, he got out of trouble a lot. He he would get let guys on ba- on the base and then he'd get out of it. But your your closer has to be a shutdown player. They the the thing that concerns me about the the bullpen right now is just that they don't really know where these guys are going to go. They don't know who the sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth inning, the relief guy is. I think they're trying to figure that all out. But I do like what the Cubs did in the offseason. I like the fact that. I don't think they necessarily hated David Ross, but they thought they could get better, and they did. They went out and got a better manager and Craig Council. I think Craig Council did a very good job at getting the Milwaukee Brewers to the playoffs new, numerous seasons in a row with very little, especially with, with missing Christy Yelich. Chris Yelich was constantly injured, and even when he wasn't, he had he played very up and down as well. Yeah. Yet somehow that, that Brewers team always lingered around. They were always there. And I, I still think the Brewers team is going to be a good team. You know, what's funny is that they still have the ma- one of his longtime managers, Craig Council's manager, that is now the head coach of the Brewers. So I think there's still going to be a lot of those same um, characteristics and traits that they're going to bring. And uh, it, it, it'll be fun to watch out how the NL, NL Central. What, what's, what's, what's your prediction on the White Sox? All right. So now we got to talk about the White Sox. Uh, I do got the shirt on, though, guys. See? Well, somewhat. I I, I I thought I could have a little bit more visibility on my White Sox shirt. I got my Southside jersey, guys. I got my Southside White Sox jersey that's ready to be worn tomorrow. I got a cigar. I got my beer in the fridge. So it's it's. I got all day. Like, everything's planned for tomorrow. But, all right, the White Sox. I think here's there's a lot of question marks. I start with the manager of this team, Pedro Gafal. I don't know what to expect from this guy. Heck, I, I, I didn't think he did a very good job last year. Now, did he have the team around him last year? No, he did not. But I think he looked lost at times. I don't think some of those players respected him. Heck, look at some of the players that Lance Lynn was talking about that in interviews. Like he, he was talking about how that was just the the group of people they had together last year was not meshing. There were some issues in the clubhouse, and he just wasn't able to control any of that. So I don't even know if this is the right manager or not. And I don't think we're going to be able to find out this year because he doesn't really have the players in place of him. I think as a White Sox fan, and for all the other White Sox fans out there, you got to look at this season as. Let's hope some of these players produce. I know I talked a little bit about this last week. Let's hope some of these players produce, and by July, we can start moving them and shipping them out and getting our minor league systems. Like, 
We got to keep our fingers crossed that Yoan Moncada stays healthy. Now that's a big if, but if he could stay healthy, play third base and get that back going and, and look valuable in, in July, you can trade him. Eloy Jimenez, can he stay healthy? Now that's a big if too, because he hasn't been healthy, but when he's he is healthy, he? what's that? Isn't he already, isn't he hurt already? He got, yeah, he left a game the other day. I don't know if he's yeah. been out or if he's scheduled to start tomorrow. I didn't see anything on my end if he was uh, not going to play tomorrow, but Again, that's a guy that if he's healthy, he can swing and he can hit the ball and he could do a very good job. He could hit. He's he's a good hitter. So can he be traded by the deadline? Can one of these guys they signed on one year deals be traded? Because I do like what Chris Getz has done. Now we could sit here and argue the entire time. Like should they have gone out and got a general manager outside the organization? Yes, that's probably what they should have done. However, I like that Chris Getz played in the game and recently played in the game. He was a player second baseman for the White Sox and the Royals. It hasn't been out that long. And I think he's got a very good idea on how to build a team and what you need to do. Like he said it this year, we need to be better defensively. So they went and improved defensively. And I'm interested to see how that plays out with some of the guys they brought in, like DeYoung at shortstop. They do got Ben Attendee still from last year. So they got some pretty good defensive players. But these guys on one-year contracts, the guys they signed Soroka, are they going to be able to move some of them at the deadline and get better? Because he has improved the minor league system. He has. He's done a good job of getting us out of, what, 29th? What were we last year? 29th, 30th? And I think we're at, like, 14th. or We're, like, right in the middle of the pack now. So that's a pretty big jump in one year to get your minor league system. Yeah, that Dylan Cease trade helped big time. Which I good thought time. that was a good trade. And yeah, if for any White Sox fan trade. that watched – and, you know, he got screwed in some games last year where he didn't have defensive help or bat help. But he wasn't the same pitcher he was from a year ago. He, he he got roughed up a little bit in some games, and not all his fault either. But I think when you're going to trade somebody and now was the time, I think they made the right move and they got a good return in for him. So I, I think I'll let you guys go around the room if there's something that stands out to you about the White Sox in your, your win projection. I can't imagine them – Winning more than 70 games, maybe 75. Maybe 75. Yeah. I'll give them 75, but I think that's going to be about where I put them. Yeah, a buddy of mine asked me, he's like, you take the over under at 61 and a half on the White Sox. And it's tough. It's tough to, to call because if they do start the season off playing well, eventually most of those guys you would expect to be traded, right? I mean, they already traded Dylan Cease. You expect Luis Robert to keep bring them back a haul. I think that's the most valuable trade piece right there. Yeah. Yohan Makata, if they can figure out a way to dump to get rid of him, they'll try to probably try to trade him. Uh, Jimenez, all these guys we were talking about. I mean, even if they are playing well and they, it's tough to lose, it's tough to not to win more than 60 games in, the, in, in baseball. I mean, that's, that's, that's a tough feat to accomplish, but the White Sox, if they do dump everybody, like I project that they're going to, then I, 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 I would, I wouldn't have a problem taking on them with 61 and a half. What did it win last year? 63? Just, they lost just over 101. Six. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. over 60. And they could easily lose 100 this year, too. <laughs> I think they're going to. I, I like uh, I'm in the same category as Kyle. I, I really don't think that they, you know, it, it's hard to lose more than 60 games or only win 60 games, let's just say. I, I was going to peg them around the, you know, 69 range, you know, 69, 70. But I, I really don't think they're I mean, that's pushing. I mean, that's pushing hard. Especially yeah. if they they, they dump, all, dump all that talent in the middle of the season. I mean, if I, I, I don't understand. I'm confused as to why the White Sox didn't make some of these trades last year. They should have uh, made some of these trades last year. Yeah, I right. think that well, that's why you see other new. That's why you see a new GM. I think the GM dropped the ball last. I think he. Well, I, I don't know. I guess I'll never know what was going through Williams or or Hans' minds on why they brought that same team back. I think maybe they were keeping their fingers crossed, like, hey, this could be it for us. Because if we blow this up, we're not going to go. We're going to go to another trajectory of a rebuild, and they maybe thought well, that, it, that's what, when I, at the end of last year. I'm like, well, obviously they're not going full rebuild build mode, or they would have traded these guys. But then they came out and, and traded Dylan Seasway, and I'm like, now I'm confused. I, I don't know. I have no idea which way they're going. But I, I, I think if they were willing to, tr to trade D Dylan Cease, and like you said, with a new new GM, I think I think most of these guys are going to be moved mid season. And if they are, I expect the White Sox to be probably the worst team in baseball. Yeah, I, I think that's what we're trajecting right now. So, we'll, guys, it's going to be fun to find out and talk baseball here throughout the season. And I know our guy, Cleet Campbell, on Friday nights, just giving you a little bit of a preview. But if you love baseball and you want to talk baseball, he's the man that you're going to want to watch here on Monsters of the Madhouse. Because on Friday nights, he's going to be doing a baseball show, which I will be popping on from time to time as well to, to, to hang out and talk a little bit of baseball with him. So I'm, I'm excited. I love baseball. I love this time of the year. It's just gonna be fun to watch, even if my team's gonna be bad. I love watching baseball in general, so I'll be watching a lot of Cubs games and Reds and 
uh, all the other uh, teams that there's, all the other games that catch my attention. There's there's some really good matchups opening day too. Yeah, really, I, I like I, I like the the Phillies like, play the Braves. I mean, Phillies and Braves at four o'clock. That's a good one. Cubs Rangers. I, I, after the White Sox game is done, I'm gonna be put. I'm gonna be going back and forth between that and the basketball games between. Yeah, us, and then you so. get Illinois and Iowa State. At, yeah, so at I, you, you, I, Kyle, man, you were just reading my mind because we're gonna jump before we end here tonight, guys. We appreciate you guys watching Monsters of the Madhouse, our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe on Facebook. Uh, before we let before we head out tonight, I do want to get in a little bit about the games this weekend because there's some really intriguing games. And I think I like how this all played out. All the ones and twos are in there, which we haven't had that in a very long time. But if we start with the Sweet, the Sweet 16 tomorrow, I, 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 there's a couple that stand out to me. I, I, I'm excited for the Clemson-Arizona game. I think that's going to be a great one. Alabama, North Carolina, and then Illinois-Iowa State is – I mean, we got ties, obviously, with the, with the Illinois ties for us. But that the I think that could be the best game of the entire weekend. Yeah, it's kind of bittersweet. You know, Illinois plays Iowa State. I think Illinois is more than capable of beating Iowa State. I think Illinois can score. They, they do struggle to play defense, but they have gotten a little bit better. You know, it seems like Shannon's inching his way up towards cl getting closer towards that lottery pick, air, mm -hmm. the top 12 picks in the NBA draft. You know, they're a good team, and they're a deep team, and I think they're better than people thought they were coming into this, this tournament. But if I'm not mistaken, I believe if they do somehow make it past Iowa State, I think then they would get matched up with UConn, no? Yeah, I have to look at that bracket again. I think it would I think double check. I think you know, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yep. They are yeah. Econ's bracket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's, that's why it's bittersweet. You know, it'd be nice to see them to make the Elite Eight, but if they get matched up against UConn, that is that's tough, man. <laughs> man, my team got bounced early, and I don't know how some dude manages to hit 10 threes when his back's to the goal. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I agree though. Um, that, uh, that that's definitely the best game, that Illinois game. Um, I really don't know how Clemson has made it this far. <laughs> uh, I, they've looked good though. They yeah. have. I don't even know how they made. I was like, how the hell's Clemson even there? And it's like it had to be because their division is just garbage or their conference. I mean, it's it's they they. You know, I mean, they were bottom feeders all year. And so I bet heavily on them to lose this last one. And obviously I lost pretty hard on that. <laughs> that, was, that, that Baylor game wasn't really much of a game. I mean, they, I know, they, they I pretty know. much dominated from the start. Yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought Clemson was going to get rolled pretty hard. Um, you know, Purdue looked strong too. I mean, yeah, I was, I was talking that that leads me into Friday's games. So you think Thursday yeah. we got a good we got a good start tomorrow. How about on Friday, Gonzaga, per, Purdue? That that I said the Illinois Iowa State that the, the other game that I think might be the best one would be that Purdue Gonzaga game. I'm interested for that. Obviously, I live down here in Knoxville for, for the Vols as they play play Creighton, which I think is a pretty good matchup. The Vols have looked good here to, um, in this tournament. Two but, point differential on that one, I think. Yeah, it, it, but I, I think that's going to go either way. But boy, uh, Purdue did so. Purdue, who I, I I've liked the way they've played so far. What do you what do you think for for Friday night? Because Gonzaga is going to be a tough test. Yeah, I think it's a coin toss, but I'm taking Purdue. Yeah, Purdue's got to get over that hump eventually. And Gonzaga, or Gonzaga, I Gonzaga, mean, they, they yeah. can't seem to do it either. <laughs> you know, so it's a battle of who wants to lose first. You know, it's, uh, it should be a great game to watch. But though. they're going to be they're great teams. I don't know how they always lose, but they always lose. I mean, they, they get to the tournament and they underachieve. Um, but I mean, I also agree. I mean, Purdue, I mean, they just looked too dominant the other day. And it was, I mean, they're far hopefully, away, it's, but, hopefully it's just some good basketball. You know, the, the yeah. first the first round was fun. It was great. It was exciting games. The second round fell off a little bit. It wasn't as intriguing. It wasn't as interesting. But hopefully these games are close. They come down to the wire. And it, even if you you, know, you don't have a dog in the fight, there's some good basketball to watch. Oh yeah, yeah. It's good. It, it, like I said, tomorrow's gonna be a fun day. I'm trying to figure out I was, as you guys were as we're talking basketball here. I'm trying to figure because I, I was talking a lot about having baseball on the one TV in my living room, and I'm like, God. I, what do I do? I like I want to watch the basketball games, but I want to watch the Cubs and Rangers game. But I, I, I think you just got to play it by ear because if, if if we're gonna be in the middle of one of the good games and you you don't want to you don't want to go away from it, but maybe you keep the laptop open too and you try to figure out like hey, yeah. you guys will be happy. I am making some Italian Chicago beef in the crock pot though. Um, I'm putting that in tomorrow morning, and I'm like I want to have, make sure I have that Chicago I had beef a sandwich. I had a Portillo's lunch today. 
<laughs> oh, dude, I, I would kill for one of those down here, man. Like, I, I, you know, when you leave, when you leave a city, when you leave Chicago, do you, I would always like, man, Portillo's. I, I can go to other places instead of that. And then you come down here, I'm like, oh, I would do anything for a Portillo's and a beef. So that's kind of why I was thinking. I'm like, I want a good Italian beef sandwich. Yeah, when I was, I was I'll living down. Right. I was living down in Kansas City for six years, and you know, you, you when you go down there, you figure people are gonna ask about deep dish pizza or Luminati's, <laughs> Giordano's, but no, it was constantly the same question: Should we go to Portillo's? Should we go to Portillo's? You know, in your head, you're like, "Oh, it's a hot dog stand," but then you start looking around at their options down there, and you're like, "Yeah, you should, you should go to Portillo's." And most, <laughs> most people down there, a lot of people down there don't don't even know what Italian beef is, and especially Giardinera, they don't have no yeah. idea what Giardinera. Jard- is. Yeah, Giardinera, I have to order online on Amazon. Yeah. So I have I have two bottles in my. I, I'm gonna use a bottle of that for tomorrow. So y'all, y'all um, blow my mind over here. I've never even heard of this place. Portillo's. Oh <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what there is? There's not one in Louisville. I, I'm trying to think because they're in like other cities, like Indianapolis. I think Indianapolis yeah, has yeah, I think one. They're in Arizona now. Georgia. Arizona, yeah, Arizona. Uh, what's that, Brian? At Giordano's in Indianapolis too. Yeah, so Giordano's is branched out Detroit, maybe. I know Detroit has a Giordano's too, but yeah, down here in Knoxville, none of the Chicago places exist. So you got to order the peppers online, and um, I made sure I've got a full bottle for the Italian beef tomorrow. So I'll, yeah, Brian I'll be- Portillo's just makes world renowned Italian beefs. I mean, they have hot, the Chicago style hot dog, they have burgers, they have salads, but the the, the beef is why you go to Portillo. Yeah, uh, I always get the hot dog guy outside the uh, field museum every time I'm over in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> He's always just standing there. So I, just, I go to the aquarium, go to the field museum. There's always a hot dog guy. Right there. Brian, I'm thinking this might be a field trip for uh, a Bears game, and that we we'll have to tra- arrange something with tracks and everybody on on, on our team. And like, let's meet well, up, and then then I'll be coming. I'll go get the Portillos for you, so you can have one, <laughs> and so you can experience that. So you because. <laughs> Kyle, I'm sure you would agree. You have that, and you're gonna your mind's gonna be blowing, and, and you're gonna be like, "Why didn't I ever have this before?" Yeah, and get it dipped. Get the Italian beef dipped. You gotta dip the bread and the juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's he, he's right on that, Brian. So, uh, Brian, I'm gonna send. We're gonna send you some. You know, we're, we're gonna keep you up there. I'm gonna get you some stuff. Send you some stuff, and, and we'll, <laughs> we're gonna we're, we're we're gonna make this work. So, uh, well, well, thank you guys uh, so much for watching Monsters of the Madhouse tonight. Um, to everybody in the chat room, we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for do, uh, checking us out. We want to thank Nicholas Moriano for coming on tonight. It's CHGO. You can watch him on his YouTube cha- on, his, on their YouTube page. He's on different videos that you can check out there. Also want to thank all of our wonderful sponsors for making our show happen. We were just talking about Bridges Scoreboard, Underdog Fantasy Sports, TC's World of Wonders. If you're looking for a jersey, tomorrow's baseball season. You can check them out. Serendipity Ice Cream Parlor. Budget Cars, and Worth Stadium Club. If you missed it, we have a big show coming up on Saturday. So Bridges Scoreboard, Northwest Indiana. Will Purdue, former great Chicago Bull. Will Purdue is going to be joining Monsters at the Madhouse. Uh, he'll be sitting down with tracks and then doing some signings, some autograph signings. While your guys there, get some food. The food's outstanding. And then they're gonna, you know they're going to have the games on. So uh, that'd be a perfect opportunity to go out, hang out with the crew here at Monsters of the Bad House, Bridges Scoreboard this Saturday. You guys could also keep up to date on our Facebook page because if you do that, we're posting all the time. We have an awesome team here that keeps you up to date with everything going on in Chicago sports. I could tell you our guy, Cleek Campbell, who is back on Friday nights with our baseball show puts great articles, really dissects some of the big stories going on in Chicago right now. He just did a couple of baseball stories that I highly recommend you guys go back and check out on our on our Facebook page. So um, that's a couple ways. YouTube channel, like it, subscribe, and on our Facebook page. Well, Kyle and Brian, it's awesome having you guys back on tonight, man. It, it, it's okay. always an honor talking to sports. You guys are – we're it's always fun to get together and talk about something that we love. Absolutely. It's always a blast, man. I, I just want to give a shout out to everybody watching tonight. You know, I asked a bunch of people to come tune in tonight, and I think a few of them here on here. So thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Always have fun here at the Coop. Thanks a lot. Great host. Appreciate it, Brian. Always nice to see you, man. Always nice. Yeah, it's been great. One last bull score. Bulls are going to win 125-96. So we're going to end it on a good note, guys. Not a sour note. A good note. Wow. <laughs> so. Well, thank you guys all so much for watching and keep up to date with everything on Monsters of the Madhouse. We will talk to you soon.